and today I'm here to bring you another Reason Reads video. As always, I've got three books to talk about, so let's just get right into it. The first book that I finished in November was my first nonfiction November read, and that was Ancient for Hawk by Helen McDonald. I read this for the sport prompt. This is a memoir of Helen McDonald's experience um, training a goshawk in the immediate aftermath of her father's tragic death, and then it's also a um, brief biography of T.H. White, the writer of The Once and Future King, who also did a um, session of training a goshawk, and he wrote a book about it, and um, Helen McDonald read the book um, during this period of grieving as well, and so it's a sort of a comparison of their two stories, and it's a very beautifully written book, and it's obviously a product of a lot of deep thought. Helen is a college professor or academic of some sort, and so she is very used to writing and thinking deeply about things, and it really comes through in, in this book. Um, I, unfortunately, was not as taken with this book as I know a lot of people are. I felt like I never really related to Helen McDonald. Obviously, her grief is something that I've never really experienced before. I've never had a parent or any close loved one really tragically die suddenly in a shocking way. Well, I mean, that's not true, but it's, it's different because it's her father, and her father was a news photographer, like he took pictures for newspapers, and he literally was like on his way to a job, and he was uh, like on a sidewalk, and he fell down and had a heart attack and died in like instant, you know, five minutes or instantaneously, and so he wasn't that young or that old, and so it really affected her, and so obviously you see how the grief impacted her, and you see her relationship with the goshawk, whose name is Mabel, but it felt like I mean, I never really got why she was doing this as a way to deal with her grief, for one thing. And it also seemed like sometimes she was kind of irresponsible with the hawk because she was grieving and because, you know, her mind was going off in different places and she was depressed. Like, she took the hawk out hawking, or Mabel out, like, hunting, and she let Mabel go, and then Mabel got away from her, and she, like, almost lost her. And then she took her to, like, another field later on that was like not like a private property and then like Mabel killed one of the pheasants there and it was like poaching so you're like what the heck something else that this book really made me think about is how grief is sort of a privilege in a lot of ways like um Helen McDonald as I mentioned was an academic and she had this like temporary teaching job and then right after her father died she then the, the contract ended, and so she had this friend that went to her house. So because she was going to lose her apartment as part of losing the contract, or, you know, the contract ending, and so she stays in this house with Mabel, and she has all this time to grieve. And she, I was just, I just kept thinking about how like most people, you would have to go back to work, and you wouldn't be able to sit and wallow, and you know, and she talks about how she felt like she was becoming like a hawk. Like she felt like she and Babel were becoming like on the same same wavelength. And so because she was spending so little time with human, you know, other humans and she was just staying in this house all day. And I don't know. And she kept talking about how falconry in general is like a very privileged um, thing. And she talked about how, you know, it's an old white, men, rich men's game, but she never really seems to acknowledge her own privilege in being able to, you know, afford this, all the stuff you need to do this, hawking, and then the fact that she has all this time to grieve because she doesn't have to worry about, you know, immediately getting another contract, and she has this free housing she can just go to for months on end, and I don't know, it just, I, I didn't, I guess I, I felt bad for her, but I, didn't, I also felt like she never really considered her own privilege and her own position in the world. So that was another thing that kind of really annoyed me about this book. And then, I don't know, I just, it was an interesting book, and I mean, I understand why people really like it, because the writing is very beautiful. I just felt like 
it didn't connect with me, unfortunately, which is kind of a bummer, but I would still really highly recommend you check this out if you've been hearing a lot about it and it sounds like it's something that might be interesting to you because a lot of people really do love it. It just wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't something that I found particularly um, interesting, unfortunately. I then read two fiction books in a row. I read Up Bees and Mist by Eric Sedelon, and this is a magical realism book, and it's sort of set in like a world that's our world, but not our world, and it's sort of in a place where it's not a specific time, so you don't really know what time period it is, but it's just a magical realism world and it follows this young girl named Meridia and she lives in a very unhappy house. Her parents had a huge falling out right after she was born and so they live together in the same house but they never speak to each other and it, they never interact with Meridia. It kind of reminded me of um, Matilda in a lot of ways and then she meets this man, boy, named Daniel, and because she's so desperate to get out of her parents' house, she marries this boy, and she moves in with his family, and his mother, Eva, is a terrible person, it's a horrible mother, you know, a horrible person in general, and so it's about how she is basically destroying everything that she loves because of her vindictiveness, and the bees and mist refer to the fact that, um, Eva can use magic to make bees sort of torment people. And then um, Meridia's mother, R Ravinia, um, uses mist to sort of like trap people. And so it's about these two women and the magic that they use and the, their impact on Meridia's life. And then Meridia, we basically see Meridia's entire, well not entire life, but a significant portion of her life, I would say about um, 20, 30 years of her life, and we see um, her and Daniel's relationship change, and we see um, her parents' relationship change, and um, Eva and Ilis's, uh, that's her father-in-law's relationship change. This was a very interesting book. It, this was my book club book for the month, so it was something I probably would not have picked up except for book club, and I, I did really enjoy it. I would say pretty much all of the characters are kind of annoying in some way, especially Eva, of course, and she's meant to be annoying. So that was kind of, you know, annoying. And then um, it also felt like you never really understood people's motivations very well, in my opinion. Like, the Meridia's parents, they hate each other, but they stay together for their whole lives. And you're like, why would you stay together with someone you hated when you could have just gotten a divorce? and moved out and like, and then, I don't know, it just seemed very ambiguous about um, why they were together and how their story played out. And then we also, um, Daniel's family has a jewelry store and then Daniel and Meridia start their own jewelry store and then later on in the book, Meridia starts another jewelry store and they all are in the same town within like walking distance. And you're like, how can all of these stores make it in the same town? Which is a minor detail, but it just, it sort of bothered me that it was like, it didn't seem very realistic. Of course, the whole magical realism aspect is not real, real, realistic either, but you know, it's just a different kind of realism, I guess. But yeah, this was really interesting. If you like magical realism, I would recommend it. And it got really interesting characters and really interesting dynamic. So yeah, I would encourage you to check it out. I then finished my Will of Catherine for the month, which was Lucy Gayhart out of this collection of her later novels. Lucy Gayhart is basically more of a novella than an actual novel, and it follows this girl, Lucy Gayhart, who is a music student in Chicago, and she gets a job as an accompanist, an accompanist for a famous singer, and she and the singer fall in love. And so it's about their love story. But then um, Lucy had a boy back home named Harry, and she was sort of in love with him before she left for Chicago. But then she comes back and she realizes, in comparison to her relationship with the, the accompanying news, that Harry is not really someone she wants to spend her life with. And so she sort of tells him a falsehood that she and the um, accompanist have, you know, 
had sex, and so he thinks she's a fallen woman. And so then we see how that changes Lucy's um, standing in the town and Lucy's life. And then there's a tragedy at the end of the book, which I won't tell you because it would be a major spoiler, but we see how that tragedy impacts um, Lucy's wife life and the accompanist life and her the life of the town that her hometown which is in rural nebraska that she returns to um in multiple times in the book so this was a really interesting book it wasn't like amazing or anything but i enjoyed it it was short i read it in the span of a weekend so you know not much to not much effort went into it but yeah i enjoyed this and right now i am reading um uh, two more books for not fiction November because again I've only finished the one prompt so far but I'm looking forward to the rest of my books and I hope everybody else is having reading some great books for non-fiction November and you're having a great day and I'll talk to you again soon bye